From the book of Acts, Peter began to speak. I now realize it is true that God treats everyone on the same basis. Whoever fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him, no matter what race he belongs to. You know that the message he sent to the people of Israel proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know of the great events that took place throughout the land of Israel, beginning in Galilee after John preached the message of baptism. You know about Jesus of Nazareth and how God poured out on him the Holy Spirit and power. He went everywhere doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. God was with him. We are witnessed to everything that he did in the land of Israel and in Jerusalem. Then they put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead three days later and caused him to appear, not to everyone, but to only the witnesses that God had already chosen. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He has commanded us to preach the gospel to the people of Israel and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed judge of the living and the dead. All of the prophets spoke about him, saying that everyone who believes in him will have his sins forgiven through the power of his name. While Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came down upon all those who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who had come to Joppa with Peter were amazed how God had poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. For they had heard them speaking in strange tongues and praising God's greatness. Peter spoke up. These people have received the Holy Spirit just as you did. Can anyone then stop them from being baptized in the water? So he ordered them baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay with them for a few days. From the Gospel of John. My children, I shall not be with you much longer. You will look for me, but I tell you now what I have told the Jewish authorities. You cannot go where I am going. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so that you may love one another. If you love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. So this, this love for one another thing is somehow missing when you're in seminary and have papers to write. I just think somebody should tell seminary professors about this. So I'm in the middle of seminary and uh, getting ready for ordination, and then my uh, ordination advisor tells me, now you'll need to start writing your papers for ordination. I said, isn't seminary enough? No, when you're finished with seminary, now you have to go through a credentialing process of exams and interviews and papers and more interviews. And so I sit down at the end of finals to now begin my ordination papers. And the first I had to write was on my theology of baptism. Now, I was fresh out of seminary, so I crafted it carefully. Very linear, a clear thesis, three supporting points, and I sailed right through that first interview easily. Which is kind of funny, because baptism in scripture is really a mess. There's nothing about it that's linear. There's no consistent practice. There are no set rules. It's funny how the church then creates linear rules in a world that God sees very differently. As far as we know, Jesus never baptized anyone. Ever thought about that? That would have been his cousin, John the Baptist, who did all the baptizing. John was roaming around first century Palestine just a few years before Jesus and continued roaming when Jesus started ministering. Now, I don't know if you know much about John the Baptist, but scripture tells us he was kind of the wild man of Borneo. 
He had crazy hair. He was a Nazarite, so he never shaved that beard. And he lived on locusts and honey. So I'm trying to imagine an unshaven beard when you eat locusts and honey. I'm thinking it's probably not a very neat guy. And his baptisms were not neat either. Because you would come down those muddy shores of the Sea of Galilee or the River Jordan. It's muddy there. And then you go into this dirty, dirty water. And before you know it, whoosh, John's dumping you. And that's how baptism happened with John the Baptist, as he yelled in a loud voice, repent, start over. Now, as if this process weren't dramatic enough, when John baptizes his cousin Jesus, the heavens open up and a loud voice cries out, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And I don't think it was said all sweet and nice like that. I'm not going to yell at you, though. You can just imagine. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Brother, Where Art Thou? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know there's a baptism scene, remember? Now, these three brothers are not good guys. They are thieves. They're, They're hiding out in the woods, making their next plan. And all of a sudden, this baptism processional starts. All these people in beautiful white robes, they're just drawn to the river, they're all processing down there singing, you know, as our choir sang. It's just so beautiful. And even that scene's quite a bit gentler than I think John the Baptist scenes, until the brother Del Mar gets a calling. He starts walking toward that river in his old dirty dungarees, and his brothers are looking at him like, Delmar, what are you doing? we got to stay hidden. we got another job to do, and it doesn't have to do with baptism. And he goes splashing into that water. He's a mess. He splashes in front of everybody. He steals the place in line, and that preacher just dunks him and says, repent. All your sins are forgiven, brings him up. He comes out and goes, I've been washed clean of my sins. It's so dramatic, his brother follows right after him and leaves the other brother behind going, oh no, what are we going to do when i got two saved brothers? For Del Mar and many others like him, baptism is that turning moment in life. That's the baptism that John the Baptist preached. It's a chance to begin again, to turn around and go a different direction, to turn around from past mistakes, past regrets, and turn toward a path of walking with God. But it's not the water that gets people there. For the water is just a sign, a sign that God's love is healing and powerful enough to help us start again. God's grace is strong enough to free us from those past regrets and mistakes those past sins and sorrows. Baptism, a sign of love. Now, the next big baptism in Scripture is very different than the baptism that John the Baptist offered. But John knew it was coming. If you read his words in Scripture, he's always foreshadowing a baptism that is greater. Greater things are to come, he always says. Because the next baptism comes not with water, but with fire on Pentecost. And what a chaotic mess that must have been. People speaking in languages they didn't even know, somehow understanding one another through the Spirit's power. And Peter seeing that this is a vision of God's promises fulfilled. As the followers of Christ are now empowered by the Holy Spirit to begin building Christ's church. You'll hear that scripture on June 9, but you heard its second version today from from our own Paul. Now, I noticed that Paul read it really sweetly and kindly. It sounded kind of like a neat thing, but, and I think on June 9th, when our graduates, it's graduate Sunday that day, are reading it, they'll probably read it politely and nicely like he did. But I don't think it was a polite, nice, neat day. Can you imagine thousands gathered? They're all speaking a different language. They don't know what they're saying. Their tongues of fire resting above their heads. It's crazy town. Baptism is not linear. Baptism is not careful and calm. 
Baptism is a stirring of something new because this is a call to birth something new. That's what Pentecost baptism was. They were birthing a whole new community that would one day be called the church. They didn't know what it was, but they knew it was new. And baptism always initiates something new. When we receive the Spirit, whether we symbolize it with water or not, we are baptized with the Spirit. In that moment, it doesn't really matter whether we use water because it's not the water that gets us there. For the water is just a sign. The sign that God's love is strong enough to create something new, to form a new community, create a new life out of an old life, or even create life from what we thought was dead. God's love can do that. And baptism in the Holy Spirit empowers us to receive that love as the creative, transformative gift it is that spurs us on to the new lives which we are called to live in the Spirit. Baptism, a sign of love. And so in the book of Acts, this young church begins figuring out what baptism might mean for them. They continue John's tradition of baptizing with water, but they proclaim that the true baptism is baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they invite all of the Jewish followers of Jesus to be baptized and begin their new journey with the Spirit's power. And so the church is strengthened and growing because of that Spirit's powerful love. Those baptisms, a sign of God's love. But today, that scripture that you heard Paul read reminds us that the Spirit isn't linear. This is not a thesis with three supporting points, this baptism thing. The Spirit cannot be contained in a nice, neat box or a perfect thesis paper. No, no, the Spirit blows where she would have us go, inspires us outside of those boxes, inspires us beyond those perfect papers. Right before the eyes of Peter and those early followers, the Holy Spirit falls upon every person gathered, even the Gentiles. Those were the non-Jews. Those were the others. And before they know it, the young church leaders are realizing the Spirit isn't just for some, but for everyone. The Spirit is for any and all who would follow Jesus. And so baptism becomes a community act, not a private act, but a communal act, a time for worship and celebration for all who would receive the Spirit. Everyone who comes to the waters and fires of baptism is welcome. Everyone. Everyone equally welcome, equally valued by God. Everyone loved and embraced by the Spirit of God. That Spirit binding all of us together so that we can love and embrace one another so that by our love, others will know we are followers of Christ, blessed and led by the Spirit. But it's not the water that gets us there. The water's just a sign. The sign that God's love has enough reconciling power to welcome people from all walks of life. A sign that God's grace is strong enough to bring us together in unity and love, despite our differences. Baptism, a sign of love. Now, before you think I'm just criticizing scripture, I think baptism is still kind of a mess today. I mean, some people insist that you baptize their baby. Some people baptize whenever you're an adult. Sometimes baptize, people baptize two, three, 20, 30 times. In this church, let's see, we, we're going to have a nice, neat baptism up here today at the font. I'm going to sprinkle water on their heads. But we don't always do it that way here. Sometimes we go to the Pacific Ocean, and we dunk them, just like John the Baptist. And I hear that some of you have done it in a swimming pool. Is this true? See, you can do it in a swimming pool. In a Baptist church, they have kind of a swimming pool right at the front, and they just dunk them right there. And then 
Sometimes we baptize little tiny babies, sometimes we baptize three-year-olds, and that's always chaotic, and sometimes we baptize 33 or 93-year-olds because we know baptism isn't about rules. Baptism, a sign of love. And God's love has no rules. The only rule is love. God loves us all no matter what. And so we come to the waters of baptism because the waters remind us to get closer to God. Not because the waters get us closer to God and one another, but because they remind us that God's love is here. God's love flowing through us like water flows through us. God's love flowing over us like water flows over us. In the Gospel of John, now this is confusing, it's not written by John the Baptist, sorry if I confused you by talking about John the Baptist, and then having Paul read from the Gospel of John. It was another disciple that wrote this Gospel. But in that Gospel, Jesus promises that a helper will come, an advocate, and that helper that Jesus promises is the Holy Spirit. And we need this Holy Spirit, this helper, to help us love. That's why the Holy Spirit lives in us, to help us love, so that we can love one another as Christ has loved us. This Spirit helper is the part of God that resides in us, that works through us, that strengthens and empowers us so that we can strengthen and empower one another. And in baptism, we invite that Spirit to wash over us, to flow through us, to nourish and enliven us so that our lives and our love will flow as freely and graciously and abundantly as God's does. This is why baptism is a beautiful celebration. Whether it's a messy River Jordan baptism in those dirty brown waters with the mud all around, or a sweet, nice baptism at a font in a beautiful sacred sanctuary. The baptism is beautiful, not because of the beauty of this space, but because of the beauty of God's love. In this moment, the water is sacred because it reminds us that God's love is flowing through us, cleansing us, nourishing us, strengthening us, enlivening us with the power of love. In this moment, we remember that Christ, the living water, can heal all of our brokenness. Bring us whole when we thought that was impossible. In this moment, we remember that the Spirit's power is strong enough for anything we might face. Any danger, any risk, we don't go alone. It's not the water that gets us there. The water's just a sign. But the sign sure helps. If I were to write that ordination paper today, it would be short and sweet. Baptism is a reminder that God's love and grace are available to anyone, anywhere, no matter what. An invitation to receive the gift of Christ, the living water, healing our lives and making us whole. And an opening for the Holy Spirit to flow in and through us so that we can live out our love for God, our love for ourselves, and our love for others, just as Christ did. Baptism, a sign of love, a sign of love for everyone. And so we come to that time of baptism. And one of the four people who have decided to be baptized today has written a poem about her baptism today. And uh, as you hear this poem, if you're he hearing a call to be baptized or to join the church, you're welcome to come forward with our four friends who are being baptized. But for now, I invite you to reflect on Abby Lewis's poem, That Doorway. 
I prayed for my salvation all through the night, just before dawn while adjusting my sight. Appeared in that doorway a shroud of golden light. My heart filled with love overcome with emotion, those early years of believing restored my devotion. Now I'm walking on air with a smile on my face. My soul overflows with amazing grace. With your love to bind me and joy in my heart, today is the day for my new start. Lord, save me with your blessing of water as I kneel and pray at the foot of your altar. I'm faith-driven and hopeful. I will never falter. My doubts and fears are with me no longer. I am changed and I am stronger. Ready to treat my guilt and live my pain, knowledge of your word is what I hope to gain. I was a lost sheep gone astray. Now I'm found in the light of that doorway.